Ever thought about what holds India together, despite its massive diversity? A single document has that power, that is the Indian constitution. It's not just about laws and regulations, it's the heart of our democracy, shaping everything from individual freedoms to our social responsibilities. Today, we are diving into the most important articles of the Indian Constitution, and by the end of this video, you'll see just how these rules make our everyday lives possible. The Indian Constitution is like India's rule book, but it's so much more than just a list of laws. It's a powerful vision of what our society should look like, how every citizen should be treated, and the kind of country we want to be. It holds within it the values of justice, equality, freedom, and dignity for all. But why is it so essential for UPSC aspirants to know these articles? Well, as future civil servants, you won't just need to understand the law, you'll need to live it and make decisions that reflect the spirit of the Constitution. Understanding the key articles of the Constitution will give you a stronger foundation to tackle questions in exams, understand current events, and build a more profound respect for this incredible document. Let's break down the most important articles you need to know. We'll go section by section, explaining their significance and why they matter to each and every one of us. First section is, the fundamental rights from Articles 12 to 35 starting with the heart of the Constitution, we have the fundamental rights. These rights are special because they're guaranteed to every citizen, and they're enforceable in court. This means if your fundamental rights are violated, you can take legal action. These articles protect our dignity, our freedom, and our equality. Article 12 defines what the state includes in the context of fundamental rights. This isn't just the central government, it includes any authority with power, from local bodies to government-controlled agencies. Why does this matter? Because it means any government institution can be held accountable for protecting your rights. Article 13 is crucial as it ensures that no law can override these fundamental rights. If any law is found to violate these rights, it's declared void. This article effectively places the Constitution above all other laws. Article 14 is about equality before the law. It's a big promise, the guarantee that every person in India, regardless of who they are, will be treated equally in the eyes of the law. Article 15 extends Article 14 by prohibiting discrimination based on religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. This article is foundational for a country as diverse as India, helping to break down social barriers. Article 16 goes deeper into equal opportunity in matters of public employment. This article ensures that public sector jobs are open to everyone, based on merit, not their background. It's a step towards a more just society, allowing people to rise based on ability. Article 17 abolishes untouchability, making any practice of it illegal. This is a powerful statement, especially for India's history, as it criminalized the practice and aims to lift marginalized communities. Article 18 abolishes titles, meaning titles of nobility or privilege have no legal status in India. The aim is clear, that is to promote a society where status is earned by merit, not birth. Article 19 covers six freedoms, including freedom of speech, assembly, and movement. These are the freedoms that allow us to speak our minds, gather for a cause, and live without undue restrictions. Article 20 protects against arbitrary punishment. It says no one can be punished for a crime if it wasn't a crime when they did it. This ensures a fair and just legal process. Article 21 is one of the most expansive articles, offering the right to life and personal liberty. Over time, the Supreme Court has interpreted this to include the right to live with dignity, privacy, education under Article 21A and even a clean environment. Articles 23 and 24 aim to protect individuals from exploitation, prohibiting human trafficking and child labor, making it clear that every individual's dignity matters. Articles 25 to 28 provide the freedom of religion, allowing individuals to practice, profess, and propagate their faith. In a secular country like India, this is crucial for religious harmony and tolerance. Article 32 gives citizens the right to directly approach the Supreme Court if their rights are violated. 
Dr. B. R. Ambedkar called it the heart and soul of the Constitution because it provides a way to defend these fundamental rights actively. Next section is the Directive Principles of State Policy from Article 36 to 51. The Directive Principles are like guidelines for the government. They're not enforceable in court, but they're essential for making laws and policies aimed at improving society. Article 39 calls for policies to ensure equal pay and adequate resources for everyone. It's aimed at reducing inequality and promoting fair economic practices. Article 40 promotes the organization of village panchayats, encouraging local governance and democracy at the grassroots level. Article 44 advocates for a uniform civil code, a common set of laws for all citizens. This is a highly debated topic but reflects the spirit of unity. Article 45 originally aimed to provide free and compulsory education to children. It's been achieved through Article 21A, making primary education a fundamental right. Article 48A encourages the state to protect the environment, reminding us that a healthy environment is essential for a healthy society. Moving on to the next section, Fundamental Duties under Article 51A. The 42nd Amendment introduced fundamental duties to remind citizens that they have responsibilities, too. These duties ask us to respect the Constitution, protect public property, and promote harmony. It's a reminder that while we have rights, we also have a role to play in building the nation. Next is, the structure of government which includes executive, legislature, and judiciary. The Constitution also defines how the government is structured, covering roles and responsibilities within the executive, legislature, and judiciary. Articles 52-78 outline the powers of the President, Prime Minister, and Council of Ministers, making it clear how decisions are made and who holds accountability. Article 76 designates the Attorney General as the primary legal advisor to the government, ensuring that all major actions align with the law. Articles 79 to 120 to cover the powers of Parliament, the Rajya Sabha, and the Lok Sabha, setting up a framework for lawmaking. Article 124 establishes the Supreme Court, with Article 131 allowing it to resolve disputes between the Union and states. Moving on to the center state relations under Article 246 and emergency provisions. Articles related to the balance of power between the union and state governments ensure federalism in India. Article 246 divides legislative powers between the union and states, fostering a balance where both can operate without interference. For emergency provisions, Article 352 allows for a national emergency during war or rebellion. Article 356 enables presidential control over a state in cases of misgovernance, and Article 360 covers financial emergencies. These provisions ensure that the government can maintain stability in extraordinary situations. Next is the amendment process under Article 368. Article 368 allows Parliament to amend the Constitution, with specific procedures to keep its core values intact. Some amendments require a simple majority, others need two-thirds, and certain changes demand state approval. This allows the Constitution to adapt over time without losing its essence. Next is the special provisions for certain states under Articles 370 and 371. Certain states like Jammu and Kashmir, Nagaland, and Assam have special provisions to acknowledge their unique needs and histories, as laid out in Articles 370 and 371. These articles recognize regional differences and aim to maintain unity while respecting diversity. But, Article 370 was effectively abrogated on 5 August 2019. This article previously granted special autonomous status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, allowing it to have its own constitution and significant control over its internal matters, apart from defense, foreign affairs, finance, and communications which remained under the central government's jurisdiction. Article 370 remains in the Constitution but is now considered inoperative, meaning it no longer grants any special status to Jammu and Kashmir. While Article 370 was specific to Jammu and Kashmir, Article 371 and its subclauses grant unique provisions to several other states. 
These provisions were included to address economic, social, and cultural concerns of particular states, ensuring that local populations' needs were recognized in governance. Unlike Article 370, which was largely autonomous, Article 371 provides limited autonomy tailored to specific needs of certain states and regions. These provisions are generally intended to promote development, protect cultural practices, and address the unique issues of these regions within India's federal structure. While Article 370's abrogation marked a shift in how autonomy is handled for Jammu and Kashmir, Article 371 continues to play an essential role in safeguarding regional interests across various states. Each subclause reflects India's commitment to preserving diversity within its federal structure, balancing national unity with respect for local identities. These provisions remind us that the Indian constitution is not a one-size-fits-all document, it's a dynamic framework, flexible enough to accommodate the unique needs of its many diverse regions. Now that we've explored these critical parts of the constitution, let me ask you this. In a country as diverse as India, do you think our rights and responsibilities should stay the same, or should they evolve with society's changing needs? If you found this breakdown helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. Leave your thoughts in the comments. What are your views on our constitutional rights and duties? And if there's a topic you'd like me to explore next, let me know. Thank you for watching.